Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with my Feb Regency TBR, some recommendations, and I'm also going to tell you the book club pick for the Classics Book Club uh, for next month for February because it all goes hand in hand with Feb Regency. If you don't know what Feb Regency is, it is a readathon going on throughout the month of February uh, that I am lucky enough to co-host with several other amazing booktubers, Emma from The Bookish Princess, Christy Lewis from Dostoevsky in Space, and Stephanie from Miss Richards Reads. I will link to their channels and their announcement videos down below uh, and my own announcement video if you missed it and you would like to know uh, more in-depth information about the readathon and the prompts. I am really not going to go in any kind of particular order because I have a massive stack of books here. Some of these are recommendations, some of them are on my TBR, some of them are just options that I want to feel flexible about that I can put on my TBR if I want to uh, and switch in and out with other things. I am really excited about Feb Regency because this is possibly my favorite time period for English writing. Uh, so this is just a really, really wonderful span of time when a lot of great writers were working. This might be a fairly chaotic video because I did have things in order in my stack, but my stack then fell down. I have put it back together and I am pretty sure that the order is not the same anymore. It's definitely not in order. Uh, so let's just kind of take things as we go. Let's start with the prompt that is to read a Regency era play. So I'm going to do something kind of bold, maybe a little bit crazy. Uh, I am planning on reading for this prompt, The Chenchi by Percy Shelley. And I only brought down my little edition of English Romantic Verse to stand in for all of my poets because I'm planning on reading quite a bit of poetry. Uh, this does include The Chenchi, a little bit of The Chenchi. But the Chinchi is a play that was written by Percy Shelley uh, that is surrounding a really uh, crazy event in Roman history uh, about an Italian family. The thing about this is, is that this is a play that was never performed in his lifetime. Uh, largely, some of that is because Percy Shelley was not really all that popular in his lifetime. He's somebody who's become more famous as time has gone on. Uh, but at the time, the Chinchi was probably read, but it was never performed. Uh, so I feel like I'm cheating a little bit, but I really want to read this. This has been on my TBR for a very long time. I've been trying to work my way through the romantics chronologically for each of them and really the Chinchi is up next for me with Percy Shelley. Uh, so I'm excited about that. Uh, I do think it's going to be interesting because I don't know how he wrote it. I don't know if he wrote it with performance in mind or if it is genuinely kind of his poetry in a play format. And so it was always meant to be read rather than performed. I'm really excited about that. This is one of my big five-star predictions of the month. Going further into poetry, since I have my little edition of English Romantic Verse here, I am planning on exploring a few poets that I have not read anything by. Uh, one of them is William Blake. I have the sense that William Blake and I are going to get along because he is apparently a very religious poet, and I'm interested really in him as a person almost more than his work, but I'm excited to try a couple of his poems. Uh, and I would also, of course, just love to stick with my faves, Shelley and Byron and Keats. I'm skeptical about Byron at this point because I think I'm past the point where I'm really going to love him. I've finished all of the Turkish romances. And so now I'm like moving into his satire period. Satire does not always work well for me, and I think that Byron is going to fall quite a bit for me. Right now, he is my favorite Regency-era poet. I don't know how I'm going to feel. I feel like Shelley will edge him out. I've always had a fondness for Shelley as a person, uh, and so I felt bad when I decided that Byron was my favorite. But I think Shelley might edge him out, and Keats I'm not very far into and I know that Keats will only get better. So for the poetry prompt, I'm also keeping things pretty open. I know I'm gonna be reading a lot of poetry, but I don't know specifics yet. Uh, I would love to revisit my favorite by Lord Byron though, which is Child Harold's Pilgrimage. That's my big recommendation for poetry. If you want to read an epic poem by anybody from the Regency period, read Child Harold's Pilgrimage or read Christabel by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, which is another of my favorites. I really, really loved Christabel, uh, and it's just so lyrical and beautiful. And The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. 
another big recommendation for me. Uh, another big recommendation for me for Shelly uh, would be Ozymandias, which is really, really short. And if you were gonna do kind of the bonus prompt for memorizing a poem, Ozymandias is one I would recommend. I thought about doing this, but I think I, I think I almost have part of it memorized, so it seems like it would be cheating. It's just a very short poem, so when you've read it a couple of times, it kind of ingrains itself in your memory, but it's a really beautiful poem. Uh, I think Keats has a really beautiful poem on the Elgin Marbles, which is gorgeous. Uh, Keats has also all of the odes. My favorite ode is the ode to Apollo. If you were looking for a recommendation on poetry, I'll try to write all of those down below. Uh, I love the poetry of this period. All of it is great. Those are some more well-known examples, but Percy Shelley has a lot of like little sonnets that barely have names that are just absolutely gorgeous. Um, Byron is the same way. And I think there's a lot of cheek in Byron if you like humor, but Byron likes to kind of meditate and go very saccharine in some places in Child Harold's Pilgrimage, which is my vibe in poetry kind of. Uh, so that's why I really love Child Harold's Pilgrimage and that's why I would recommend that one. But uh, you could go any which way with this prompt. Those are just a few of my current favorite poems from the period. Next, we're gonna go into my Mary Shelley section. I have four recommendations for Mary Shelley uh, and one is going to be our book club pick for February. So I'm excited about that. Uh, of course, let's talk about Frankenstein. The edition I have right here is the 1831 edition of Frankenstein. The 1818 edition is probably the one you want. Uh, it is probably a little bit rawer, in my opinion. I would love to read the 1831 and the 1818 edition side by side just to see what she changed, but Frankenstein is an interesting case where an author got to revisit a work and essentially make quite a few changes to it. There is a lot that is different between the 1818 and the 1831 edition. Uh, I have no idea which one I read at this point. And when I read this for the first time, I think I was under the impression that I read the 1818 edition but I actually think I read the 1831 edition. Uh, so this might be something to look into. Uh, just check the edition of Frankenstein that you have. Both are probably very, very wonderful, but uh, a lot of people agree the 1818 is probably the one that you want to read. But I always think it's interesting when an author gets to kind of revisit a work and change things that they don't think worked about it. And you have to think Mary Shelley in 1818, a teenager, uh, and then in 1831, a woman who has lost basically everyone in her life. She's lost her husband. She's lost her friends. Uh, she's lost children. She's a very different person. And so what she wants Frankenstein to be is very, very different from what it was when she was a teenager. And so I think there are horrifying elements in both versions of the text. But I think the 1831 one will probably be... Uh, more sad, if that makes sense, a little bit darker in tone, just because that's the time of life that Mary Shelley was in. Uh, so this is one that is, of course, a high recommend for me because it is one of my all-time favorites. I don't actually have four Mary Shelleys to recommend. I had another book in my hand, sorry. So the next one that I would love to recommend is another of my favorites of all time, and that is Valperga. And so this is Mary Shelley's second full-length novel, and it is set in medieval Tuscany in Lucca. Uh, and it is about kind of a Byronic hero, Castruccio Castracani, which I just have to say his name because isn't it just an incredible name, Castruccio Castracani? And he is a figure that actually lived. So this is historical fiction focusing on an actual historical figure. But there are two female characters in this work that are her own inventions that I think are genuinely fascinating. And the amount of research that went into this book is genuinely stunning to me. I really have a soft spot for Italy and a soft spot for Tuscany, uh, specifically historical fiction, and I don't think we get to see medieval Tuscany often enough. That's my opinion. And so this is kind of set in the days of Dante and Petrarch and Boccaccio, and it's just so dreamily written. Uh, it is Frankenstein to the extreme. It takes some of the ideas that Frankenstein was playing with and it takes them in a different direction, which I think is really interesting. If you have read Frankenstein and loved it, I do think that you would probably like her historical fiction. It's just a different animal. I think this, in my opinion, I think this is better than Frankenstein. I know. <laughs> Shock of all shocks. This is one that I would love to reread and I actually genuinely considered it. 
I genuinely considered rereading it this month, but I am trying to go in chronological order with her works as well as the romantic poets. And so next up for me, is a book of hers that I have DNF'd. Uh, and it's not because the book was bad, I just wasn't in the mood for it. This is going to be our pick for the Classics Book Club for February. And so I hope that you will all join me in reading this this month. And that is The Last Man. And so The Last Man by Mary Shelley is dystopian science fiction. It is set in the 21st or the 22nd century, I'm not sure which one, but essentially a plague wipes out mankind and we follow who will become the last man. And so this is a little bit prescient. She was uh, kind of seeing into the future a little bit here. So part of the reason that I put this down the first time is that I really didn't want to read anything about the current situation related to the current situation when I picked this up. But I also really struggled with this because this book is clearly a meditation on Mary Shelley's own life. She wrote this in 1824. Uh, and so this is immediately after the death of Byron. Uh, Percy Shelley died in 1822. And so in many ways, she is the last man in her own story, in her own life. It's deeply, deeply sad in my opinion. And so there is a lot of pain on the page in this book because a lot of the characters represent Byron, Shelley, Claire, her stepsister. Uh, and so it's just really, really an emotional read, but it's so beautifully written. I will say just something to keep in mind if you're gonna join me in the book club this month. This book is very strangely written. It's more about the idea than it is about the characters or the plot. And that's a lot of romantic literature in general. The themes and the ideas, they're a little bit more important than the story that you're telling. And so there will be moments where you're confused, where you would have liked to have seen an event happen, but they just mention it in passing. But this is just going to be a really fascinating read, I think. I'm so excited by this. I love to read classics of... Uh, science fiction where they kind of envisioned the future and I like to see what they got right and what they didn't. I think this will be a really great one to explore through the book club and I hope that you will join me. Another book on my TBR for the month is Nightmare Abbey by Thomas Love Peacock. This is a really short novella uh, that is kind of doing something similar to The Last Man in that it has a bunch of characters based on real romantic and Regency figures. Uh, so there are a lot of characters in this that are based on Byron, Shelley, Mary Shelley, uh, and Coleridge, I believe, which is really exciting. And it's always good to have a short option on your TBR for the month for a readathon, in my opinion. So this is one that I am excited by and that I think will probably be a nice quick read. Kind of an odd one that I have here as an option is the Oristia that was translated by Percy Shelley and his cousin Thomas Medwin. Uh, so this is, of course, a translation of an ancient work, but it was done by Percy Shelley in the Regency period. And I'm really fascinated by this. I've heard this is just an absolutely gorgeous translation. Uh, so this is one that I would like to get to. I would like to get to all of my options, but there's a reason that I am just calling them options. Uh, I don't know whether or not I recommend this, but I thought I would tell you about it in case you were curious about it. Percy Shelley did quite a bit of translation in his lifetime, uh, and his translation of Dante is stunning. And I genuinely wish that he had translated all of Dante. That's, that's my wish, that we would stumble across a manuscript where Percy Shelley had translated all of Dante. Wouldn't that just be absolutely amazing? But I imagine that his translation of the Oristia will be similarly beautiful. Next, we have my little stack of books that influenced Jane Austen. So one of our prompts is to read a book that was an influence on Jane Austen or that was kind of mentioned in her works. This first book is actually a real recommendation for me for this prompt and it's Belinda by Mariah Edgeworth. I read this for Jane Austen July last year and I really, really loved it. I think this book is very similar to Jane Austen, but it is also playing with some really interesting social issues of the day. Uh, dealing with racism, dealing with sexism. One of the characters in this book wears pants and she actually fought a duel with another woman. And she said the reason that they would have gotten in trouble was not actually for fighting the duel, but for wearing pants. And so that's just kind of a hint of what's going on here. There are also characters of color in here that I thought were handled fairly well to have been 
in a book written in the early 1800s. Uh, so this is one that I just was really floored by and I highly recommend it. I think there's a lot of talk also about Evelina by Frances Burney. And I also read Evelina last year for Jane Austen July. And I wasn't as enthused with that as I was with this. This book was really fun to read and really lighthearted. But at the same time, I thought it had quite a bit to say and so this is one that is a high recommendation for me if you are still kind of looking uh, for an option for this prompt. My two options for this prompt are two books that I considered making our book club pick of the month, but both are really, really long and I don't know that I can read both of them in a month or even read one of them in a month, especially the shortest month of the year, but I'm gonna try. <laughs> uh, one of these is Waverly by Sir Walter Scott. Now, Ivanhoe is a really great option for this prompt or just for the prompt to read a Regency era work. Walter Scott is an author that Jane Austen mentioned quite a bit in her own letters, and she mentions quite a bit about his poetry uh, in Persuasion, I believe, and I really love Sir Walter Scott's poetry. He's a wonderful poet to pick up for this readathon, and I really hope that you do. My favorite by him is Marmion. Uh, I think I really have enjoyed everything that I've read by him. Marmion is another long one, but I really enjoy Sir Walter Scott, and Ivanhoe is one of my favorite books of all time. I really would love to reread Ivanhoe because uh, I just want to see is it still a favorite, but I read it many years ago and it's just such a joy and a delight to read. I expect that Waverly will be the same. Waverly is set in Scotland and I believe this is actually the first in his historical fiction series. So Ivanhoe is technically one of a number of books that Walter Scott wrote that were technically in a historical fiction series that was very, very loosely connected. You can read them in and out of order, I believe, but I think that Waverly is actually the first. So I would like to start with Waverly and then continue through the series. Sir Walter Scott was instrumental in founding the genre of historical fiction as we know it today. And he's also a very romantic writer, I believe. So I just think I'm really going to enjoy this. This was published in 1814, so in the height of the Regency. So this is one that I'm really hoping to get to during the month. Another that was really pecking at me, I really wanted this to be our book for the book club this month, but I decided against it. This book is really, really long, and I think it's gonna be a book that is hit or miss for some people, uh, and that is The Mysteries of Udolpho by Anne Radcliffe. I have also previously DNF'd this. I started reading this for a Jane Austen July a year or two ago, uh, and I just wasn't in the mood to read. It actually had nothing to do with the book. I just was not reading anything, and I thought it wasn't fair to Anne Radcliffe the first time I was trying to read her just to not give it my all. Uh, so The Mysteries of Adolfo is kind of spoofed a little bit in Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen, so it's a really great one for this prompt. I have never read a full novel of hers, but I've always had the sense that she's gonna be an author that gets on with me. I've always thought that we are just gonna really like each other because I love the Gothic. One thing that I will say is I just hate this edition. It's so tight. Look at it. It's so tight. So maybe I'll get a different edition of this if I decide that I really wanna pick it up this month. But another of the co-hosts, Christy Lewis, is reading this right now. And I think she's really enjoying it. So I'm really encouraged by that. But it is a very, very long book. It's like 700 pages. And the first 200 pages or so, uh, I believe are kind of just meandering about. They're kind of just travel logging and talking about nature, which I think I might enjoy more than the actual Gothic storyline. But I've heard her writing is just absolutely stunning and she really likes to talk about nature and she likes to talk about architecture. Uh, so I just think I'm probably really gonna enjoy her. Uh, so this is another one that is a big option for me this month and I'm gonna say is on my TBR. This and Waverly are very high on my TBR for the month. Some of my stack did stay together. So this is my Gothic fiction stack. Technically, I could have included The Mysteries of Adolfo here, but I think that it really works as a book that was an influence on Jane Austen. And of course, Jane Austen can go for many of these prompts as well. But I figured y'all probably knew that. Uh, so I decided to go for a few more obscure items. So these books here are books that I think can really fit the main prompt in particular. Uh, so this is my Gothic fiction stack. Uh, and some of these I've read, some of these I've DNF'd, and some of them I haven't read. Uh, so these are just some options, but they are also recommendations. 
Uh, so the first of these is The Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner by James Hogg. James Hogg is a pretty big figure in the Romantic movement, uh, and he's not so much talked about today, but he was pretty big at the time. This is also set in Scotland, but it's about a guy who is a Calvinist, uh, and so he kind of believes in predestination, that you are on a certain path and you don't really have the willpower to move off of that path. And so he kind of believes that no matter what, he is saved, no matter what, he's going to go to heaven. And I believe he decides to put this to the test. And um, this is not really how the Calvinists think, but this is how this book is written. So I believe this was very, very contentious and it was very controversial during the day. Uh, and I'm excited about it because it is very, very short. And I've heard a lot of really good things about it. It's under 200 pages, and like I said, sometimes you want to have a short option for a readathon. I also have this edition of Percy Shelley's Attempts at a Gothic novel. Uh, so he has two Gothic novels, and they are called Zestrozzi and St. Irvin. Uh, apparently, neither of these is very, very good. A lot of Shelley scholars will even admit this and say this was not his best work, but I'm still curious about it. I would like to read everything that he wrote. Uh, and so this is one that is high on my TBR because it is actually some of the first writing that he did. And so I'm going in chronological order. I really ought to have already read these. But so as you might can see from the size of the book, both of the novels are very, very short because they can both fit in this edition. And I believe, yeah, one is under 100 pages and the other is also under 100 pages. And so this might be an option if you wanna go for kind of a lesser known classic. I don't know whether or not I would recommend them because I haven't read them yet, but from what I've heard, uh, it doesn't really inspire a lot of confidence in me that these are going to become favorite books for me. But I would assume that Zestrozzi probably takes place in Italy, which is always a selling point for me. I'm just a little bit weak when you mention Italy. I'm kind of already there. I'm willing to read it. Uh, so I think maybe if I read one of these, I will try to read Zestrozzi. Another great gothic tale that is high on my TBR, but I'm not gonna officially put it on there. This is just an option, but it's uh, Melmoth the Wanderer by Charles Maturin. And this was written, I believe, in 1820. It's just celebrated its bicentennial. And this is another kind of gothic story about an immortal being, I believe, who just wanders around. And so there's a lot of time hopping. I believe there's a lot of flashbacks to uh, the medieval period, to the Renaissance. It just sounds really, really interesting. There's also an element of Faust in it. I believe the main character kind of made a deal with the devil. That's why he's in the situation that he's in. This is another one that's quite long, but I think would be a really wonderful read. I love Gothic fiction of this period, uh, and I just think it's really dreamily written. I think it really gets at the heart of horror. Another option is Zafloya by Charlotte Dacre. This takes place in Italy, so that's why I picked this up. Uh, and it's set in the 1500s, I believe, but this is a really transgressive book in terms of gender. I've heard it's incredibly progressive, but I've heard that it's also very horrific, but I believe it's set in Venice in the 1500s, and what more do you need to know? Truly, what more do you need to know? I don't know what the gothic element of it is. I kind of want to keep blind on that because I know some of the gender issues. So I feel like I know quite a bit of the themes that the book is going to be dealing with, but I know next to nothing about the plot. There are only a few books that I have truly set on my TBR. This is not one of them, but in an ideal world, I would really like to get to this this month. Next, I have The Vampire by John Polidori. And this is a book that I do in fact recommend. It is a novella, but I would say it's more of a short story. Uh, and it is technically kind of the first tale of the gentleman vampire. And so John Polidori was Lord Byron's doctor. Uh, and he was there with Lord Byron, Percy Shelley, Mary Shelley in Switzerland the night that Mary Shelley decided to write Frankenstein. Essentially, Lord Byron said, hey, everyone, let's write a ghost story. Polidori and Mary Shelley are the ones that really took that prompt and ran with it and were really successful. We have a lot to thank the vampire for because it really did pave the way for things like Dracula, Interview with the Vampire, kind of a human vampire, but also a genuinely handsome and sexy, alluring figure of a vampire. And so the vampire in this book is actually based on Lord Byron. It's just really, really funny. I love that a lot of romantic fiction in particular was constantly making reference to everyone in the circle of the day. And so this one is no exception. I do think you'll probably be a little bit 
disappointed in it because it's not very fleshed out. It's too short. Uh, in my dream world, I would write a retelling of this because I think there is so much here. There is so much that he hints at that he does not take further. I think this would have been such a wonderful novel, but he chose to make it a novella. Why? I don't know, John. I mean, John, why did you do this to us? But it is really good and it's really beautifully written. I think that you enjoy it more for what it could have been than what it is. Last but not least in my gothic section is The Monk by Matthew Lewis. I DNF'd this last year and I DNF'd this because in many ways this is in fact truly a horrific book. Uh, it is truly scary in a way that a lot of the others of the gothic genre of this time period are not. And I can see that this book was controversial at the time. This essentially ruined this man's life. Matthew Lewis, he was like gonna run for parliament. He really was set up for a great political career. He published this book and people were like, you are a sick, sick man. And I can see why. I only made it halfway through, so I don't even know what horrors the second half of the book had. And maybe that is a selling point for you. Maybe you would really like to find out what was really going on in this book. And I would love to revisit this one day. I just think that I was not in the mood to read something as dark as this was. And I don't think I expected it to be as dark as it wound up being uh, because there is just an element of beauty to the Gothic writing of this period often. And so it's often not really scary because it's really meditating more on ideas and themes and it's not really in your face horrific. This book is in your face horrific. Things happen that are just genuinely horrific to read about. I would like to come back to it one day uh, and I think it would be a really interesting one to read alongside Anne Radcliffe's The Italian. She apparently wrote The Italian in response to this book. And as you might can imagine, this is about an incredibly evil monk. Uh, and the picture on the front is not really an indication of the character. Apparently the monk in the book is hot, you know, a, a very dreamy looking, uh, good looking guy, a Byronic hero, if you will, in the years prior to Byron when this was written. So one day I would like to revisit this and I would really like to revisit it in conjunction with Anne Radcliffe's The Italian. This is my nonfiction section. So our last prompt is to read a bit of nonfiction and this can be nonfiction written during the Regency period, or it can be nonfiction about the Regency period. So I have a few options for during uh, the Regency period and then a few that are more modern books written about the Regency. One from the period of the Regency is John Polidori's diary. So John Polidori, who wrote The Vampire and was Lord Byron's doctor, actually kept a diary while he was working for Lord Byron. Essentially, he was always going to uh, tell the papers and tell the journals about his experiences with Lord Byron because Byron was such a big celebrity of the day. And so that's really why he kept this journal. And he also died very, very young. So that's why it's quite short. But it's just such a fun read because he talks in it about the fact that he had this massive crush on Mary Shelley. And he talks about this time when he jumped over a fence or something to impress her and he hurt his leg really badly. And so he had to stay in the house while they all went out and walked around the Swiss Alps. Uh, so there's just something really funny about this. And I think it's also really charming and humanizing to read a primary source like this, to read something that is so personal to somebody of the period. Uh, as with all diaries and journals, there are bits of this that are really, really boring, but there are bits of it too that are just really fascinating to read. His relationship with Byron was really interesting. He both admired and hated Byron uh, and Byron both admired and hated him. So there's kind of a really interesting dynamic to their relationship and also to the relationship that he had with Mary Shelley. Uh, so this is just a really interesting read and it is one that I highly recommend and I need to reread it so that I can mark it up. On my TBR for the month is William Hazlitt's selected writings. I'm not gonna read all of these, but William Hazlitt was a really celebrated essayist from the time period and he was one of Percy Shelley's favorites. And so I was really excited to find that they had an edition of this over at Oxford. And so I'm excited to get into this. He has a lot that is kind of art criticism, but also just kind of meditations on works of the day. I believe he also wrote quite a bit about the French Revolution, about Napoleon. So he kind of 
was writing about politics, philosophy, history, literature. He did a whole bunch of different things. And so I'm excited to get my feet wet with him and to just dive in and read a little bit of what he has to offer. My two options for more modern nonfiction about the period uh, are uh, This Long Pursuit, Reflections of a Romantic Biographer by Richard Holmes. I'm not really sure what this is. I'm not sure if this is a memoir of Richard Holmes and he is kind of using Regency poetry to contextualize that, or if he is talking about the fact that he has written biographies of a lot of different uh, romantic poets. He apparently uh, evokes the lives of scientific and literary women, Margaret Cavendish, Mary Somerville, Germain de Stael, Mary Wollstonecraft. He investigates the reductive myths about some favorite romantics, the love-stunned John Keats, the waterlogged Percy Bysshe Shelley, the opium-soaked Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and the mad visionary William Blake. And so I think this is going to cover a lot of different bases, so this one is a big option for me this month, and I have not heard very much about it, uh, so I'm not sure what the consensus is, if people really enjoy this or not. Last but not least, I have this massive biography of Keats that I have been meaning to read for a long time. It's by Andrew Motion. This is a book that has unfortunately gone out of print. I found it on Abe Books. So if you're patient and you just kind of look around on Abe Books every now and again, you'll probably find it and you'll probably find it for very cheap. I think I paid $3 for this, but this is unfortunately a book that I believe has gone out of print and you can't get an e-copy of it. I have heard nothing but good things about this. I believe I first heard about this over on Steve Donahue's channel. He said this is probably the best biography of Keats that there's been. And so I'm really excited about this. I think I'll just get started on it this month but it is a massive, massive book, as you can see. So this is one that I'm hoping to start, but I likely will not finish in the month of February. So those are all of my options for Feb Regency. Those are some of my recommendations. That's the book club pick for February, The Last Man by Mary Shelley, and I hope that you will join in with me. I would love to know down below if you are going to be joining in with Feb Regency and what is on your TBR. But that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.